Hello there. Come sit a while, find a comfortable chair. No rush. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, and that's because I'm a stickler for the rules, which led me to wonder, why are we sticklers for rules? I don't mean in terms of conduct, but, but why do we use that expression? Because we stick to it? Uh, curiously, the answer came up in my reading of today's entry of the Book of Days. What are the chances? Well, hi, I think. If you take the time uh, to look for information, you will often be delighted by the result. So, I've not always been a fan of rules. I think I mentioned I got thrown out of three schools. Uh, one of them was an American high school where they had a ridiculous rule that you had to be there every day. Uh, this seemed an absurd amount of time to spend with other people uh, when I could be somewhere else reading on my own. My British boarding school, where I was sent in a last-ditch attempt by my parents to keep me confined, had any number of bizarre rules. Uh, girls were not to sit on each other's beds. Heaven knows what might have come of that. And no one was allowed a long-handled hairbrush. I was fully 35 before it dawned on me why that might be. Have a think about it. I should think anybody who went to British boarding school years ago probably has the experience uh, to find lockdown rather familiar. I remember there was a British man uh, released from months of captivity in Libya many years ago and when he came home he was asked how it was and he replied, no worse than school. At my uh, particular place of boarding confinement we were allowed out twice a week, once for church on Sunday and more thrillingly downtown once a week on a Saturday morning for precisely 45 minutes. Just over a hundred of us girls in ill-fitting dresses and straw boaters would be marched two by two down to the high street. A crocodile of repressed hormones seeking a moment of escape from our horribly confined lives. The strangest rule applied to this retail outing. Uh, we were allowed to shop, but only on the left-hand side of the high street. I don't know why. I don't know what was thought so devilish on the right-hand side, but I know that for years I could but look across the cobbled road with longing at Marks and Spencer. As we only had uh, three quarters of an hour, the girls would disperse at a run when we reached the top of the high street, dashing to buy sweets and makeup. I, however, was an oddball and only ever went to the second-hand bookshop called Thorpe's. It was a place of wonder to me and I shall forever be in their debt. Here I discovered Edith Wharton, Emily Dickinson, Jane Austen, all in dog-eared paperbacks. So at the moment, uh, the rules say I can't shop at all uh, for books, but I am glad I did all those years ago, which brings me to my book of days. Uh, today, uh, for some reason, uh, the author is obsessed with one Sir Thomas Parkins and Cornish wrestling. Anybody? Apparently, Sir Thomas, who was from a place called Bunny in Nottinghamshire, uh, passed away today in 1741. But before he did so, he took the time to write the in-play or Cornish hug wrestler. So Parkinson seems to have been an eccentric fellow, and who doesn't love that? He was a country magistrate and, by his own account, a terrific wrestler. So I think he had time for this because he inherited money which I always recommend as a way forward in life. Uh, he also inherited a cracking house called Bunny Hall. It's what people used to call an ancestral pile. How glorious to be left such a thing. In my family, if you inherit an ancestral pile, it only involves a genetic tendency to hemorrhoids. Uh, Sir Thomas loved wrestling and his estate had a park large enough for him to hold an annual wrestling match. Rather pleasingly, this led to him being known as the Wrestling Baron of Bunny. I feel that's a title of a children's book I've yet to write. Anyway, this annual match was open to all comers with a superb prize of a gold-laced hat worth 22 shillings. Second prize was nowhere near as good. You got three shillings and no hat at all. Uh, Sir Thomas always took part and quite often finished the day wearing the gold-laced hat himself. So the Cornish Hug Wrestler. It was published in 1713, and as far as I know, it was the very first How to Wrestle publication. Uh, I'm not an expert, but I can now tell you uh, that you ought to wear a pair of linen drawers wide at the knees and spend your time learning how to do throws such as the flying horse, the hanging trippet, the in-clamp and back-clamp, the pinion, the gripes, the buttock, and the in-lock. The referee was known as the stickler. And you needed three of these. Rather pleasingly, the name is not because they stick to the rules, 
but because they raise a stick to indicate whether someone has scored. I like it when things are straightforward. Uh, it reminded me that I do have a book which is full of sports rules, although in this case uh, about golf. So I used to play golf uh, and then I had kids. Uh, my brother is a brilliant player and years ago he gave me this. It's the Golfer's Handbook from 1955, so three years before I was born. It seems a silly thing uh, to have kept. I'm sure nobody uh, needs to know uh, who the president was at Cleethorpe's Golf Club in 1955 or or how that year a round would have cost you three shillings and sixpence. Uh, but this book is an excellent example of my belief that almost every publication has hidden in it some snippet of value. This one is snippet heaven. Uh, I like golf, uh, although I think you have to love it in order to be comfortable dressed with so little regard for fashion. Anyway, here we are, it's a wonderful entry. Um, at Isha, on the 23rd of November 1931, George Ashdown, the club professional, in a match played his tee shot for each of the 18 holes from a rubber tee strapped to the forehead of Miss Ina Shaw. I mean, I've checked this out. Uh, it turns out Ina was a nurse, probably should have known better. Uh, there are 18 holes in golf. Uh, apparently George only did this for the first 13. I don't know what happened after that. Maybe Ina got the hump and went off to the clubhouse. Uh, apparently Ashdown played against a Mr Mansell who didn't muck about hitting off somebody's head. He used a wooden peg. But despite this, Mr Ashdown won the match in comfortable style. Uh, then there's another one here. Uh, During the Royal and Ancient Medal meeting, the 25th of September 1907, a member of the Royal and Ancient Club drove a ball which struck the sharp point of a hat pin in the hat of a lady who was crossing the course. The ball was so firmly impaled that it remained in position. I'm pleased to tell you it says in here, the lady was not hurt. I love this story. This is Britain at its best. Ladies in hats catching flying objects on hat pins. When the British set their mind to it, they are redoubtable. Uh, take these. These are the 1939 to 1945 war rules for golf. So it says here, during the Battle of Britain, people on golf courses were attacked by German bombers. Uh, to meet the conditions, uh, rather than going home, uh, the following rules were written by Major G. L. Edsel, Secretary of St. Mellon's Golf and Country Club, and generally adopted. So there are seven rules uh, which begin, number one, players are asked to collect bomb and shell splinters from the fairways to save these, causing damage to the mowers. Well, this is Britain soldiering on. You might get hit by a bomb, but would somebody please save the lawnmower? Or how about this one, rule number seven. A player whose stroke is affected by the simultaneous explosion of a bomb or shell or by machine gun fire may play another ball from the same place. There is, however, a penalty of one stroke. Perfectly reasonable. Everybody calm down and play sensibly. That's the kind of attitude which will get us through anything. Uh, Sir Thomas Parkin's home to wrestling, Bunny Hall, is still there. I, I don't think you can visit at somebody's house. I mean, you could visit, but they might be surprised. Please don't say I suggested it. Uh, I think you can still see the old wrestling ground in the gardens of the local pub, the Rancliffe Arms, uh, which by the look of it does a fine carvery. Sadly, I lack a copy of Thomas's book on Cornish hug wrestling. I've looked online and I could buy a reprint, but I think I'm okay. I probably know enough. I really like the Cornish hug part though. It sounds just what's needed. It's a funny thing about a hug. I am a great hugger. I think it is one of life's infinite pleasures. I never thought I'd get to the stage where the kindest thing I can do for anyone is keep my distance. So thank goodness for modern technology. I am sending you all such a hug, it would knock you over. In a good way, not in a I want the gold lace hat way. Take care, be kind. <laughs>